So we're presenting the case of an 83-year-old male with a history of PAD, uh, previously treated with a right fempop bypass, which is now occluded, who presented with a right second toe ulcer, present for approximately two months. His additional medical history is significant for CKD stage 3 and additional cardiopulmonary comorbidities listed here. Surgical history also significant for cabbage. He is a 75-pack year former smoker. Next slide. Several allergies listed here. Um, extensive medication list. He is on aspirin and Plavix, both last dose yesterday. Next slide. Um, physical examination is significant for non palpable DP and PT pulses. On his right second toe, there is an ulcer that measures approximately 0 0.5 centimeters in diameter. Next slide. Pre procedure labs listed here. Again, um, Patient is CKD, latest creatinine, 1.9. Next slide. ABIs and TVRs listed here. On the right side, you'll see the ABI is 0 0.49. The TBI, um, even worse, 0 0.29. Next slide. So our assessment and plan, this is an 83-year-old male with multiple cardiopulmonary more comorbidities. He has a history of peripheral arterial disease with an occluded right femme bypass, uh, non-healing right foot ulcer consistent with critical limb ischemia, Rutherford 5. Uh, our plan today is for right lower extremity angiography and intervention using radio uh, to peripheral approach. We're going to use limited and half strength contrast where appropriate on account of the patient's CKD. All right, let's go through the, uh, the imaging. So, um, as Dr. Tatano mentioned, we have a patient here with CLI, uh, reduced ABI, uh, and as you ex would expect with CLI patients, he has multi-level disease. Uh, we have treated these cases successfully uh, transradially, uh, multi-level, including the SFA popliteal, and even down through the tibials. Um, just a couple technical points. Um, he's a relatively tall gentleman. Um, we cheated on the radial artery, so we're, we're about mid-forearm. Uh, to gain about 10 or 15 centimeters in terms of length. Uh, we went ahead and did an aortogram, which showed that the inflow is intact. And subsequently did our runoff, which shows that the proximal uh, vessels are, are fine. The common femoral, profunda, and proximal SFA are patent. When you get down to the level of the popliteal artery, we have, a, we have two occlusions, one uh, of the proximal popliteal artery, and one of the uh, behind the knee popliteal artery. Give this a second here. I thought you said in a second. No, I said there's heparin. Slow down speed up, down speed up. Okay. All right, so these are our two proximal lesions uh, in the popliteal artery. And then as you go down distal, uh, there, there is tibial disease. So you can see that uh, there's multivessel tibial disease. There's uh, an occlusion of the uh, distal third or prox of the posterior tibial. The anterior tibial is also occluded, and the distal third of the uh, perineal is also occluded. So this is a very, very difficult transradial case. Uh, we actually got down to the level of the first lesion with a 035 quick cross catheter and a glide wire. We crossed that first lesion uh, and we managed to actually stay intraluminal. And then we actually then worked on crossing the second lesion here. So now we're across the second lesion. And so now I, I would put this out to the crowd. Um, at this stage, uh, what would people do? Would people attempt to do orbital atherectomy with uh, CSI? Yes, I think uh, you know now we have the tools to do orbital atherectomy from the uh, from radial approach using the two hundred centimeter CSI. So I think that would be the first approach. I don't think there's any other atherectomy device is long enough to get to the popliteal from the radial approach, correct? Right. I agree. Now, is the fact that the distal, I think the proximal lesion is more of um, kind of a uniform lesion. The distal lesion is more like a cauliflower type plaque. Is that a concern when using orbital? Yeah, yeah I uh, I worry about 
these bulky calcs and embolization with CSI. So, you know, you'd have to think about doing a NAV6 filter here. When we crossed the initial lesion, we were approximately down to the level of the uh, patella, about 150 centimeters there. The longest fempop stent is going to be the Medtronic with the Intrust delivery system, which is going to be 150 centimeters. Um, one thing I'm thinking is if we um, do a very gentle orbital atherectomy, do a, do a light angioplasty, and get a stiff wire, if I can uh, straighten everything out and gain some length with um, with a stiff wire, I, I may be able to get a stent down in that, that location. I... I am concerned about that distal lesion and being able to get a stent across that. Um, so this may be a case where we, we'll, we'll probably attempt this, um, but there's also a good chance that we'll convert to femoral here. So um, I think we still have a, quite a bit of work to do. Uh, so I think we may uh, uh, get back to it and then maybe come back to this case in a little bit. So this, this, that, that's certainly another option here is to you know, convert this to a uh, radial pedal, uh, which we've certainly done in the past as well. So. Um, and then the other consideration is if we're going to do that, if we're going to go radial pedal, we need to have a tibial balloon long enough to to angioplasty that segment there um, from the radial approach once we pull the uh, tibial axis. I my personal preference is once uh, the you know once I pull the pedal axis. I actually will balloon the axis site to make sure there's no dissection or flow limiting uh, lesion at the site of arterial puncture, especially when we're going to use uh, potentially a five, uh, four or five French sheath here. Is the groin is a is this patient a large patient or is the groin suitable for anagrade? Um, no, he's not a large patient. It would be suitable for anagrade. Yeah, I think I would favor going converting the femoral. Yeah, that would certainly be easier. <laughs> in terms of your workup beforehand and like choosing, you know, whether you're going to do a radial peripheral intervention, what kind of stuff do you do? Do you get like a CTA or do you do diagnostic angio ahead of time and have them come back? Yeah, what it's, we do. It's, it's actually nice to have um, a CT angiogram when possible. This gentleman has chronic kidney disease. And so, you know, we, we elected not to do that. Um, but it, it, I think it's, reasonable to do a diagnostic angiogram, determine whether it's feasible in this kind of scenario, and then, um, you know, treat accordingly. So we were able to cross those lesions. We started off with a short 5.6 slender. Then we switched to the 119 uh, 5.6 slender destination sheath, which we parked in the uh, upper SFA. And then using a glide wire and an 035 quick cross, 150 centimeters, uh, we were able to cross uh, the first lesion. It wasn't long enough to cross the second lesion, uh, so we used the new CSI crossing catheter, which is um, 200 centimeters long. So we used that to cross the second lesion, and we used that with a 035 quick cross. And after that, we swapped out for the Viper wire, which is 430 in length. And then we use the CSI. We use the 1.5 CSI solid, and that's 200 length, uh, which is the transradial version of that atherectomy device. Yeah. We then angioplastied uh, to 5 millimeters using the Pacific Plux. So after ballooning with the five, we decided to stent that proximal lesion. And we stent it with a six millimeter by 60 in trust. Okay. Yes. And that's from Medtronic, right? Correct. That's also from Medtronic. Okay. So, so you... this is actually our posterior tibial. So you ballooned the posterior tibial. So you were able to reach all the way down there with... Uh... Yeah, so we actually, after crossing the tibial occlusion, we actually used the 200 length crossing catheter to do that. 
Uh, and we crossed with the 430 Viper wire. And then we yeah. angioplasty with the Ultraverse. And we used a 3 millimeter by 100 and Ultraverse that, balloon. So that's the uh, Bard's 014 uh, rapid exchange balloon. That's correct. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of go backwards. So this is us initially ballooning that tibio. And that's on a, that, I think that's actually on a 200 centimeter length. That is 200 yeah. and rapid exchange. Yeah, so that's a nice balloon. Yeah. So you can see this is our initial angioplasty. That was a 5 millimeter by 120 balloon. Was it angio was it CLI or? And this is the angiogram afterwards. Mm. And so this is where we're at. Yeah, looks way and better. we actually kept this completely radial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would open up the outflow, you know, at least one, preferably two vessels, if I opened up a popliteal occlusion. I mean, th this looks great. That posterior yeah. tip is, is a juicy vessel, so it's got good outflow. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and swap out the 119 sheath for a short sheath and then use a TR band. Yeah. So, Brandon, to your point, I mean, we, we do use that classification a little bit. The issue with this patient specifically, you know, it's a CKD patient. We want to try to limit, you know, it's going to get one contrast load, obviously, for the angio, trying to limit the amount of contrast. MR's out, right, at that point. So um, we we tried a little while to do non-contrast MRAs, and it didn't really work that well, it, it works great for clearing the the pelvis. Maybe some of the the in bigger patients, maybe the SFA, but anything popliteal and under, we weren't having good luck with it. Totally, yeah, I agree. Same here. Yeah. Yep.